Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I'm taking you through a little bit of the science and some of the ideas that are being shared with regards to issues around the COVID pandemic. And I came across this on X or formerly Twitter, and I thought it was worthwhile explaining a little bit about the science with regards to IgG4. And it was this post from Human Spective looking at mRNA injections as the Trojan horse. And it's a conversation between Neil Oliver in the UK and Brett Weinstein from the Dark Horse, um, uh, Dark Horse podcast, talking about a hypothetical military and biodefense perspective. And I'll be sharing with you a short clip from that conversation so that you understand what is going on. In order for you to understand the clip, just in case you don't necessarily get a grasp of the science around IgG4, I'll do a quick review of it so that you can make sense of what they're talking about. Uh, just before I start, a quick reminder, <clears throat> coming up in just a few days time, COVID heart storm, uncover the secret scars on the heart. This is very important. And this is how I'm predicting the future with regards to the heart-related presentations that are already happening and you will see more of in the next few years. If you've been following me for some time, you'll notice that I'm about two to three years ahead of the reality in terms of this being published in newspapers and so on for you to hear. So please, if you're interested, look in the description below. Let's get back to this particular presentation from uh, the discussion with Neil Oliver and Brett Weinstein. I'm going to pause it at a specific point to make sure you understand the science as to what they're talking about. Let's go to the first part. Here's the other part of it. One of the things we discovered late in the battles over COVID and COVID policy was that people who took two or more of the mRNA injections began to produce a special class of antibody, IgG4. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but IgG4 is a class of antibody. It is the kind of thing that an allergist tries to trigger in order to get an allergic reaction to some environmental influence like a pollen to reverse. IgG4 is an attenuation signal. Right. And so the fact that somebody who's gotten two of these mRNA injections produces IgG4 in response to the spike protein means that at least we have a novel solution to a age old problem in bioweapons. So Pausing you right here, just so that you understand what he's talking about, if you haven't heard about this as yet. IgG4 is real. <clears throat> it is an important part of immune modulation. Everything in the body is about balance. And in the same way that you have an aggressive immune response, the body needs something to try and balance off those effector cells so that you can dampen down immunity. And so this is a critical part of how the immune system works. So just taking you through a few slides so that you understand what he means when he talks about IgG4. As usual, start off with the basics. This is the virus, spike protein on the surface, trimeric, three points on it, can bind ACE2. And this is a side-on view as to what that viral spike protein looks like. And in effect, what they've taken is this spike protein on the surface, to trigger the immune response to target it so that it will fight against the virus. That's the theory of the spike-based vaccines. Now, your immune system produces multiple types of immunoglobulins, IgM, IgD, IgG, IgA, IgE. This is what you produce in an allergic response. This is what you produce early in an infection. IgA is mucosal immunity. And IgG is the primary long-lasting antibody that your immune system works with. But IgG is broken into four different classes, IgG1, 
IgG2, IgG3, and IgG4. Of these classes, IgG1 and 3 are the ones that trigger the immune system. And the most long-lasting one will be IgG1. IgG4 is the balancing. And for the time being, don't worry about IgG2. But IgG4 is the tolerant antibody. And what it does is that if your body is being exposed to an allergen for a long period of time, the, the best example is beekeepers being stung by bees all the time, the body knows to downregulate the immune response to the bee venom. And then it uses that with IgG4 to tell the immune system to back off. Don't worry too much about this. This is not so important. And so when you look at the typical approach, this is where it becomes problematic, is that the IgG1 and 3 are the inflammatory antibodies that trigger the immune system to attack the virus and the spike protein. And the IgG4 does the opposite. It tells the immune system to back off because there's too much of it. And so this is what Brett Weinstein is talking about, that this IgG4 is present in large amounts. And what we noticed, which was very unusual, is that after the third dose, you know, he said the second dose, but in reality, it's the third dose, um, post-second, post-third IgG4, you find this huge increase, 38 times increase in IgG4, compared to the second. And this is a red flag. This is not normal. This is not what you would expect if you're trying to produce a vaccine that targets a specific antigen in the immune system. So in effect, you then have a situation where you have lots of antibodies being produced and the antibodies here are binding to the spike protein and um, therefore telling the immune system to back off very, very important pattern that is occurring. And the issue that he was pointing to with regards to the idea of the Trojan horse, he said something that's very important is to do with mRNA vaccines. Because when we look at this paper here, this was done from 2023 about the class switch to IgG4 antibodies. With regards to normal infection, only a small amount, if you had infection and then mRNA, only a small amount was uh, IgG4. If you had mRNA um, and then infection, you're talking about 41% was IgG4. And if you had mRNA and no infection, it was 45%. But it's important to note that this does not really happen with vector vaccines. There's only 16%. Um, if it's just somebody who's been hospitalized, natural immunity, it's 2.9%. And so this is primarily an mRNA issue. And my thought is that the only, the primary difference between the vector vaccines like AstraZeneca or J&J &J and the mRNA, which is Pfizer um, or Moderna, is the addition of two protein um, proline residues on the spike protein to stabilize it. Uh, it's not exactly at this position. This is just giving you an idea that they made an adjustment to the spike protein to make it more stable. My suspicion is that it's therefore made it harder for the immune system to degrade it, which therefore leads to more tolerant antibody because the immune system is struggling with it. That's the scientific background as to what they're talking about. And now we can go back to what it was that they were saying in relation to the question about the bioweapon. So that's a whole different perspective. So let's hear what they were trying to say then. Exactly the one you point to. Weapons manufacturer has to figure out how to build a weapon that the enemy will suffer from that his own army will not. The traditional way of approaching that is we'll come up with a really good vaccine that the enemy won't have, we'll vaccinate our people and release the thing and the others will suffer, right? 
that doesn't work very well because frankly, it's very hard to make a good safe vaccine. However, the production of IgG4 by multiple mRNA injections, specifically in response to spike protein, opens up the reverse play. You can make a population vulnerable if you can get them to take the vaccine, all right? They become biologically vulnerable because their body produces this IgG4 mechanism. Did they know that that was going to happen? I have no idea. But the fact that it was weapons makers who seem to have got it seemed to have brought this particular virus across a species boundary that it could not otherwise have jumped and that they seem to have been partnered with the production of a vaccine that produces not immunity but vulnerability is conspicuous. So the thing that you're calling in that, in that gameplay, the thing that you're calling and offering to people as a vaccine, and we've all learned to question what's exactly meant anymore by that word, it functions as a Trojan horse, because you get people to think, to take what they think is going to protect them, when in fact it's releasing into them all the little soldiers that are going to make them susceptible to the disease that's coming anyway. That was the idea. And my view on it is that I don't think they knew this was going to happen. Genuinely. And I tell you why I don't believe that they knew it was going to happen is because when you when you look at who was given and who wasn't given initially, it, it definitely targeted the poorer countries. So Africa didn't get any, only 2% of Africa was vaccinated. And so the idea of it being a Trojan horse doesn't make sense because they demonstrated they weren't that concerned about the outcomes in Africa. You know, Haiti, similar kind of pattern. Even when we compare the regions in the Middle East, the people who have, I think, the cohort that has one of the lowest um, vaccination rates just because they didn't um, trust it was Palestine. And so you can imagine that they certainly weren't involved in weapons manufacturing, if that makes any sense. So I understand what they're saying, but I think that they're overthinking it too much. Someone had asked the question really is, what's Gert's answer to this? And Gert had done a whole section, as you can look on his um, Substack or um, Voice for Science and Solidarity. But here is what he said in the post. Um, BW Brett Weinstein just can't stop his know-it-all attitude regarding immunology, even though he doesn't understand a single iota of it. The shift towards IgG4 antibodies induced by RNA, uh, mRNA vaccines did not attenuate the population's immunity to the foreign agent, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, meaning that it hasn't really protected the population from the effects of SARS-CoV-2. And I'd agree with Gert on that point, that this, I think, is one of those issues that they did not anticipate. They didn't know it was going to happen. And then when they saw it happening, they ignored it, just pushed on. And this characteristic alone could be one of the reasons why we're seeing so such high circulation of ongoing COVID in highly vaccinated regions. These are important scientific questions to answer. As for the reason, the logic, and the thinking behind it, as someone said to me once, um, some things can appear to be strategic when in fact they're just a cock-up, a mistake, a flaw something that they never saw, but they don't want to acknowledge it, so they remain silent. All we can do is continue to look carefully and try and make sense out of what appears to just be nonsense. Have a great evening.